Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the book of Isaiah. And we have covered much of the book of Isaiah already. This is lesson number 10 for March uh, 6th of 2021, entitled, Doing the Unthinkable. Wow. We would like to begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is for us to bow our heads before you, recognizing your presence with us and giving us guidance to think about these great ideas that were preserved for us from so many years ago, 2,700 years ago, amazing. May we be drawn closer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> In Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 53, verse 12, Isaiah recorded the vision of a suffering servant, which the Jews interpreted as being the suffering of their people and their nation, but which Christians now know to be a prophecy of the true Messiah, Jesus Christ, coming down from heaven and suffer, suffering the worst possible indignities, finally dying on the cross in a shameful, humiliating display to make it possible for each one of us to be saved. There's at least a third way to view this section of Isaiah. By his life and death, Jesus answered and disproved all of Satan's claims and accusations against God. Jim? Isaiah 50, verses 4 to 6. The Sovereign Lord has taught me what to say, so that I can strengthen the weary. Every morning he makes me eager to hear the, what is what he is going to teach me. The Lord has given me understanding, and I have not rebelled or returned away from him. I bear my back to those who beat me. I did not s stop them when they insulted me, when they rolled, excuse me, when they pulled out my hair of my beard and spat in my face. American Bible Society, 1992. Wow. So we see that Isaiah presented a brief sketch of what the Messiah would experience. Now, if you thought this prophecy applied to, of course, this is leading up to it, and we haven't got there to 52 and 53 yet, but you thought these were prophecies of the, the nation of Israel, what would it mean to pull, the, pull out the beard uh, of, of the nation of Israel? Earlier in Isaiah 49, 7, I'm going to read that for you. Israel's holy God and Savior says to the one who is deeply despised, who is hated by the nations, and is a servant of rulers, kings will see you released and will rise to show their respect. Princes also will see it, and they will bow low to honor you. So, we've already been told that the one who is hated and despised will one day see kings rise to respect him, and princes bow low before him. In ancient Near Eastern cultures, the honor of a family or group was considered to be a life and death matter. If someone was dishonored or mistreated, one could expect the family or group supporting the victim to retaliate sooner or later. So the question arises, did Jesus really have to go through all that terrible treatment just to save us? I mean, I've asked that question a little differently and on some occasions. Do we have to go through all the things we're going to go through just to go to a perfect place where there are no problems? Well, look, at, you know, we talk about Jesus or God being our, our, our savior, our healer, but uh, what happened to uh, John the Baptist? Mm -hmm. What happened to the Apostle Paul and Peter? Yep. All of them died, and then Jesus died. And so what does it say? The flesh counts for nothing? Yeah. It's the spirit. Paul. Paul. So I would like to suggest an additional idea. He had to go through all that he suffered to answer Satan's accusations and questions before the entire universe. That was necessary for God to convincingly bring the great controversy to a close in the minds of every living being in the universe. Without that, God would not have won. The great controversy might have begun again. Unless God wins the great controversy, there would be no eternal home for us to be saved to. Carrie, I think that's yours. Okay. 
<clears throat> when Christ came to our world, Satan was on the ground and disputed every inch of advance in his path from the manger to Calvary. Satan had accused God of requiring self-denial of the angels when he knew nothing of what it meant himself and when he would not himself make any self-sacrifice for others. This was the accusation that Satan made against God in heaven. And after the evil one was expelled from heaven, he continually charged the Lord with exacting service which he would not render himself. Christ came to the world to meet these false accusations and reveal the Father. <clears throat> I may interrupt there for a second. Yeah. I mean, think about that. Satan is accusing God of being selfish. Yeah. I mean, what kind of a... <laughs> and he also claims it's not fair. Because yeah. look what all these other people are doing. And uh, yeah. you're, you're making provision to educate them. And uh, no, you... you yeah, really. And he's, a he's a created being himself. You yeah. would have thought yeah. he'd been a bit better, wouldn't you? Yeah. All right. We cannot conceive of the humiliation he endured in taking our nature upon himself. Not that in itself it was a disgrace to belong to the human race, but he was the majesty of heaven, the king of glory, and he humbled himself to become a babe and suffer the wants and woes of mortals. He humbled himself not to the highest position to be a man of riches and power, but though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. He took step after step in humiliation. He was driven from city to city, for men would not receive the light of the world. They were perfectly satisfied with their position. And that's from Mellon G. White. Morning Talk in Battle Creek in 1890. Mm -hmm. Reported in the Review and Herald. Yeah. February 18 of 1890. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's not clear to us exactly what we're, that's talking about. Jesus, after being baptized, spent the first six months very quietly. He went, we know he went up to Galilee. We know that he attended a wedding feast. We know that he healed a, a certain young man and so forth. But then he came down for the first Passover. And he performed some amazing things that first Passover, cleansing the temple and so forth. And the, the Jewish leaders were already trying to kill him right there. It, his ministry had hardly even started. So for that next year, he's quietly working under the radar as much as possible around Judea because he knows that when, when he finally really stirs up the, the Jewish leaders against him, he won't be able to stay in Judea. Yeah. So then... What we know is John the Baptist was arrested by King Herod, and that was a signal to Jesus that things were getting hot. It's not time to stay in Judea anymore. So that was the time he moved his ministry from Judea to Galilee. And most of what we read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke was events which took place in Galilee, in that, that one year of ministry in Galilee. And so at the end of that one year of ministry in Galilee, John's head was be, John the Baptist was beheaded and Jesus says okay it's time to move even beyond Galilee now and he took his disciples outside of Galilee traveled around to a little bit in Samaria but all the way up to Tyre and Sidon if you remember and then over to Caesarea Philippi and came down on the other side of, of, of the Jordan and, and Dead Sea and to Perea and so forth uh, and so each one of those moves major moves by Jesus came at a time when there was a crisis really for John the Baptist. Uh, anyway, 2 Samuel 10, 1 to 12, we're not going to take time to read the whole thing, uh, talks about David, what he did in response when he is uh, when uh, one of the neighboring kings that had been a friend of David died. And so his son came to power and David sent some ambassadors over there and said, I'm so sorry. Um, you know, your father was a friend of mine. I would like to be friends. And what, what kind of response did they get? Do you remember? His ambassadors were abused. Their, their part of their beards was cut off. Their clothes were cut in half. Uh, and so forth like this, they were just absolutely despised because the 
counselors of this young man said, you don't think that those guys came over here from David just to tell him how sorry he, he was that your father was dead. They're here as spies. And of course, you know the whole story. And th so what did David do? He responded, he, met, he grabbed his army and he went over there and conquered the whole nation. <laughs> so it just gives you a little idea about how people responded to what they regarded as slights. So would one of us be willing to be despised and mocked by standing up for what we believe? Do we trust in God at every step of our lives? Do we refuse to rebel against God no matter what happens or who tempts us? Well, look at this whole passage that we're going to be focusing on today, Isaiah 52, starting with verse 13, up to 53, verse 12. Jim? The Lord says, My servant will succeed in his in his task, and he will be highly honored. Many people were shocked when they saw him. He was so disfigured that he hardly looked human. But now many nations will marvel at him, and kings will be speech speechless with amazement. They will see and understand something they had never known. I'm going to interrupt <clears throat> there for a second. When is it do you think the kings will be speechless with amazement? The one that they crucified, the one that they destroyed, coming in the clouds of heaven, maybe? That's yeah. future then, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. The people reply, Who would have believed what we now report? Who would have seen the Lord's hand in this? It was the will of the Lord that his servant should grow like a plant taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us take notice of him. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing that would draw us to him. We despised him and rejected him. He endured suffering and pain. No one would even look at him. We ignored him as if he were nothing. Now I'm going to interrupt there for a second. <clears throat> we don't know what Jesus looked like. We have no idea. We have generally followed the example of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, wasn't it? who painted that Last Supper scene in the, yeah. there in, in, in uh, what's the name of the city there? Turin, anyway. Venice or somewhere? No, no, no what, Northern Italy. Oh. Starts with M. Can't think of the name of it right now. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and we've, we've sort of followed that example. So generally we have, you know, fairly mid-length, uh, uh, full, full head of hair and a certain shape and so forth. But now we can see in modern times People are painting black Christ and different Asian Christ and so forth like this, and we sort of smile when we see that. But the truth is we don't know what Jesus looked like. This passage is very interesting. When I read it, I always struggle with it because Jesus, God could have made Jesus the best looking person that ever walked this earth. And people would have been attracted to him because of his looks. But it sounds from this like he made him to be plain and very, very ordinary. Nothing was attractive about him. He didn't want people to be attracted to him because of his physical appearance. He, they wanted, he wanted people to be attracted to him because of what he did and what he said. That was his message, his what, yeah. the, the, the whole thing. Okay, verse 4. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have, the pain that we should have borne. All while we were thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. And but, think about that for a second. This but, lesson doesn't focus on that, but what, what, do we, what do we say about the life? How many people believe that the only reason for Jesus to come to this earth was so God's wrath could be poured on, out on him and he could die, because, and God's wrath against sin that our sins, our sins were piled on Jesus, and now God in his anger descends on Jesus, and, and he, he, he kills him, and now his, his wrath is satisfied, and we're okay, right? Well, even go back to the book of Job, the, yeah. the, the friends of Job, hey, look, look at yourself. It's, yeah. it's pretty obvious that, that, you're, that you're not in God's favor. Right. Uh, you, you deserve what you're getting. Anyway, let's press on to uh, verse 4. Verse, verse 5, five. Yeah. But because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishments he suffered. We excuse me, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost. 
each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. He was treated harshly, but endured, endured it humbly. He never s said a word like, like a lamb before, about to be s slaughtered, like a sheep just about to be sheared. He, <coughs> excuse me, he never said a word. He was arrested and sentenced and led to, off to die, and no one cared about his fate. He was put to death for the sins of our people. He was placed in a grave with the wicked. He was buried with the rich, even though he had never committed a crime or ever told a lie. The Lord says, I was, excuse me, it was my will that he should suffer his death and it was a sacrifice to bring forgiveness. And so he will see us, excuse me, and so he will see his descendants. He will live a long life and through my, him my purpose will succeed. After a life of suffering, he will again have joy. He will know that he did not suffer in vain. My devoted servant, with whom I am pleased, will bear the test punishment of many, and for his sake I will f forgive them. And so I will give him a place of honor, a place among the great and powerful. He will willingly gave his life and shared the fate of evil men. He took the place of many singers and prayed sinners. that the made <laughs> he took the place of many sinners and prayed that they might be forgiven. Yes. Uh, what do you think about when it says back up here it talks about his descendants so he will see his descendants? Well, he's he's our <laughs> referred to as uh, Almighty God. He's, he's referred to as Son of Man. He's, he's also known as our Father. Everlasting Father. Father, yeah. Really. yeah. So it's the same one. He's, he, he was a... Carried on. And, and it's interesting, we talked about this in another lesson. You know, how can he be Father and Son at the same time? He's, he's David's ancestor, but he's also the Son of David. Yeah. Well, here's another example. He's, he's a Son of himself. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, this is not the milk of Isaiah's word. He has prepared his audience by developing the messianic theme from the early part of his book and following the overall course of the Messiah's life on earth. The prophet started with his conception at, his conception of birth. Remember the story we talked about back in the beginning, Isaiah 7, 8, 9, all that stuff. Introduced his, his identity as a divine Davidic king, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 elaborated on his work of re restoration for Israel, Isaiah 11, 1 through 16. <clears throat> and what happens at the end of 11, 16, remember? We're talking about wolves lying down with lambs and all that kind of stuff. And when is that going to happen? Future. Yeah. So we're talking about someone whose life spans the entire history of the universe, as far as we know, the, the history that we know about, you know, um, and quiet ministry of liberation from injustice and suffering, Isaiah 42, 1-7. Then Isaiah revealed that the Messiah's grand drama includes a contrast of tragedy before exaltation, Isaiah 49, 1-12, and Isaiah 56-10. Now the suffering servant poem plumbs the depths of the tragedy, our Bible, adult Bible study guide for Monday, March 1. So, here we see that this one who eventually is going to be honored by kings and princesses is going to go through a lot of trouble, right? And what will be the result of that new king from David's line? The land will be as full of knowledge of the Lord as the seas are full of water, Isaiah 11, 9. The result will be that all the people of God will come back together and live in peace. When will that be? I can ask you out there, if you know your biblical stories, when will the whole earth be at peace once again? Only at the third coming. The one who was coming to, had a very strange pedigree. He was the eternal father, and yet he was a descendant of David. How could that be? He would possess all the power of divinity, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, yet he would be born as a helpless baby to a poor family. He would be despised because of his supposed, supposedly illegitimate birth. 
but have power to control the elements of nature and save all those who trust in him, judging and ruling to fairly, even for widows and orphans. And there's a famous song that's been sung fairly recently around Christmas time called Mary, did you know? Yes. And it says, one of the verses says, he will calm a storm with his hand. I mean, just <laughs> he, he wakes up in this boat that's sinking and the fishermen who've lived their lives on that, on that sea are crying out for help and find, here's Jesus sleeping. Wake up, please. And what does Jesus says? Oh, <laughs> just like that. You know, I, I, you know I, I'm sure I would sit there. I wouldn't be able to say a word for five minutes, I think. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> just, just amazing. I think that song is one of the most touching songs. Amen. Amazing. The, here she's holding this little tiny baby, and he's, it ends up he's the great I Am. Yeah, yes. It's my favorite song of all time. Well, he will produce a world where there will be no death, no dangerous animals, eternal peace for all the inhabitants. He will be so misunderstood that people will say that because of his claims to be one with God, religious leaders and their followers will believe that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Amazing. Well, we just read that passage, Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. We see the valley shape of this experience of the one who came down from his place in heaven to suffer the worst kinds of insults, even dying on the cross as a traitor to the government and then rising again to eternal glory. So that's a valley. Think about that, you know. From heaven to this earth, to the worst, dying the worst kind of death, and back to heaven. Uh, we're reminded of Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Let me, 5 through 11, just read that. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. The attitude you should have is the one that Jesus, that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. And Phillips translate that, the death of a common criminal. For this reason, God raised him, that's the other side of the, the valley, he, this reason God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name and so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees. And how many does that include? Everybody. Including Satan? Yes. Including all the evil angels? Yes. Will fall on their knees. And all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that... That message is repeated in, in Revelation, chapters uh, 4 and 5, if you want to go over there and read it sometime. Okay, so what are we to learn from these passages? Reading Ephesians chapter 1, 7 through 10. For by the blood of Christ we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God which he gave to us in such large measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had always, already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan which God will complete when the time is right is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. Okay, now let's think about that. What is being brought together by the life and the death of Jesus? At one month. At one month. And how many, how many does it include? All. All creation. Does that include just this earth? The entire universe. Okay. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to Himself. So there it is. The whole universe back to Himself. 
God made peace through his son's blood, that's Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. So Paul is making it very clear here that the plan of salvation is much larger than just us here. The work of Jesus will not be finished until the entire universe is brought back together in peace. Jim? Through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than, this, even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe. The charge of Satan, that is against God, refuted. The nature and result of sin made plain, and the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated from the signs of the times. Okay, what do we mean when we talk about the perpetuity of the law? It goes on forever. Is it nothing okay. changes? And but the perp it also includes another aspect, and that's that it involves everybody. It means that God's law is perfect. Right. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. That's the only way to run a universe. Okay? Um, but the plan of redemption, actually that's a, still part of your quotation there. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward to win just before his crucifixion, he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. The you act notice of, that Ellen White left out a word, didn't she? Yes. Uh, many pass, uh, uh, King James and many followers talk about, will draw all men unto me. But they put, the King James puts it in italics, as yes. I remember. Yeah, exactly. And italics means it's not there. Right. It's not there in the Greek. Yeah. Okay. That was John 12, 31 and 32. The act of Christ by in dying, the salvation of men would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe who to justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would, it would establish the perpetuity of the law and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. All of that process is education, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was in Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, page 68 and 69. Yeah. Uh, by coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. Not alone for this earth born children was this revelation given. Not alone for his earth born children was this revelation yeah, given. Not alone for his earth born children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, 1 Peter 1, 12. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. So the plan of salvation, how God managed to save some of us, is going to be the study of the angels for how long? Forever. Endless, endless ages. ages. Endless ages. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep, deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The arch apostate had so clothed with himself so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. Desire of Ages, page 758. And probably that implies they hadn't realized what a disaster it would be if he were in charge. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 
Having been beaten and covered with bleeding wounds on his back, Jesus was crucified which caused bleeding, gaping wounds on his hands and feet. Having had all of his clothes removed, he was a revolting sight. That is exactly what the Roman authorities wanted to happen to anyone who was crucified because such a person was regarded as a traitor to the Roman government. That's exactly why all that happened. And Satan said, nobody can live through this and not rebel against God. Nobody can live in this, through this kind of a situation and not sin. But Jesus did what? Remained absolutely pure. Despite that, there was no, no backbiting, no, no cursing, swearing, none of that. Having been, having been thus treated, he would shock the world by rising from the dead and ascending to heaven to take his place on the throne of God. Why would God allow such a thing to happen to his son? Well, look at back again at Isaiah 53, 2 and 3. It was the will of the Lord that his servant should grow like a plant taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us take notice of him. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing that would draw us to him. We despised him and rejected him. He endured suffering and pain. No one would even look at him. We ignored him as if he were nothing. Wow. God could not want anything of a worldly nature to attract us to him. He did not want anything of a worldly nature. God wanted some of us to be attracted to him purely because of his divine nature and love. However, because of his claims of divinity, most despised and rejected him. And then look at Isaiah 53, verse 4, that we emphasized a little bit earlier. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain which, that we should have borne, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. When we say it was thought by punishments as punishment sent by God, what does that mean? We had a misconception of what the purpose of it was. Yep. It wasn't punishment sent by God. Back in the beginning, Genesis 2.17, God had warned us of the, of the consequences of sin, but we disobeyed anyway. And Satan has been ultimately successful in leading every single human being except that one to sin or rebel against God's will. And because we could not fathom why all this was happening to him and following Satan's suggestions, we assumed that God must be punishing him. Wow, what a twisted way of reality. Amazing. Well, again, verses 5 to 9, I see the time is moving on. I'm not going to read that again. God knew something that we had refused to recognize. God knew that if we sin, we will die that death, which is a direct result of sin, Romans 6.23, because our sin separates us from God. Remember Isaiah 59, verse 2, one of our lessons coming up. I also quote Romans 6.23. Yeah. Um, sin pays its wage. Yeah. God isn't doing it. It's sin does. Sin mm -hmm. does it. And there would be no possibility for our salvation. So God himself came to demonstrate what is meant by that death, which is the ultimate and unavoidable consequence of sin. But because he was divine, he could die and still rise in his own power and ascend back to heaven to take his place as the ruler of the universe, the other half of the, the valley here, right? Okay, Kerry? When the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. At what point in his life do you think Jesus recognized that he had that kind of power? Ever stop to ask yourself that question? I mean, think of the typical teenager who thinks, yeah, you know, I can do anything. Well, what if you said, I can die and I can come back to life again? Wouldn't, wouldn't you brag about that? And he's basically also, also he's saying that you're not even going to get the satisfaction of killing me. I'm mm. going to lay down my life and take it up again. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I've, I've wondered how the devil treated him when he was a kid, say, 10 or 12 years old. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you read those two chapters in Desire of Ages about his, his youth, yeah. just amazing. There's that chapter of his experience at Jerusalem in the middle, but the chapter just before that and the chapter after it, which is mostly stuff that there's nothing about that in the Bible, but Ellen White talks about his, his childhood experience. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Mm. So I lay down my life. I might take it again, okay? Yeah. Uh, now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. It's from Desire of Ages, page 785, paragraph 2. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, when the, there, uh, there are obviously some priests who remembered many of these details in the life of Christ. They must have remembered. Because yeah. I'm sure they went back and they talked about it. They talked about how they could use these ideas to, to bring up cause against him and everything else like this. And then they saw it actually happen, yeah. just exactly as he prophesied. I mean, what would you do? <laughs> yes. Well, the life and death of Jesus give us a choice. God knew that there was no other way to demonstrate what needed to be shown. We can choose to live a life with the assistance of the Holy Spirit that is patterned after the life of Christ, or we will die the death that he died. It will be a death not of beating, blood loss, or crucifixion, but of being separated by our sins from God, the source of life. Isaiah 59, 2, Acts 17, 25, and Matthew 27, 46. So is it really possible to believe that someone could come down from the throne room of God, go through all those experiences, and then manage to return to retake his throne in heaven? Seems impossible, doesn't it? Was it possible for Jesus to take all that beating, scorning, torture, crowning with thorns, and crucifixion for our benefit? What did the universe looking on think of all that? And, of course, my question I would like to ask is, what see we we don't we we read all this story and we think about the priests and what they were doing we think about jesus what about what satan and all his evil angels were doing all this time and the onlooking universe they could see all this they could see exactly what satan was doing satan was desperate he had to get jesus to either sin or to give up and go back to heaven without dying he knew that if jesus died and this thing was over and then he rose again out of the grave it was all over for him this was a life and death situation for Satan. Well, think of the story of Job. What was accomplished through that tragedy? And who specifically, who was responsible for all of Job's troubles? <laughs> Job 1, 9 to 12, and 2, 1 to 16. I'm just going to read a couple of verses picked out of that. Job 1, 8. God speaking, Did you notice my servant Job? The Lord asked. There is no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. He worships me and he is careful not to do anything evil. And then what did Satan say? Well, you know, he only does that because you have this great high fence around him. No one get to him. Yeah. Well, you know what happened at the end of the book of Job? Job 42, 7 and 8. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, one of these guys that was accusing him of all kinds of things, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. Satan had made all sorts of accusations against God, including the claim that God was not a correct and reliable judge of character. Otherwise, he would not have cast Lucifer or Satan and his followers out of heaven. See, if God really judged true character, he wouldn't have thrown us out of heaven. Satan speaking. So God allowed Job to go through that terrible experience to demonstrate that a particular human being that he, God, had declared to be righteous, upright, would remain faithful to him, and Job would do that no matter what 
Satan did to him. Wipe out his whole family, wipe out all his wealth, wipe out everything, give him terrible diseases. He thought he was going to die. Yeah. Once again, Satan was proven to be what? Wrong. And that's an example of God's foreknowledge. Yes. Many people, they read the book of Job and they think Job had a lot of problems. I mean, that he was sinning, really. Mm -hmm. People today, the commentaries and what have you. Yeah. Were... So, let us be clear. Jesus suffered in unbelievable ways. From the time he appeared on, in that manger in Bethlehem, Satan and all his evil angels were absolutely determined to defeat him. Almost immediately, through Herod the Great's efforts to kill all the male babes, babies, they hoped to destroy him. We're not, we're not going to let this guy come here and challenge our, our kingdom. This babe, we can get rid of him, right? Yes. Satan had a three-step program by which he hoped to defeat Christ's mission. One, he assured his evil associates that no one, and we all would agree with this, no one yet had lived as a human being on planet Earth without sinning. No one. Not a single person. And thus he would get Jesus to sin. But he failed to do that. Then too, having failed that, as Jesus' ministry is carrying on and he's getting further and closer and closer to his goal, if he could not get Jesus to sin, he would make life so difficult for Jesus that he would give up and go back to heaven, thus breaking up the plan of salvation. When that failed and Jesus was dead in that tomb, number three, Satan and all his angels were determined to keep that body dead. Because they claimed that what? Anybody who's dead, that's their territory, right? That belongs to them. They claimed that every dead person belonged to them, that death was their realm. But when an angel was sent from heaven arrayed with God's glory and came down to this earth, there was nothing that Satan and his evil angels could do but scatter. Now, we, we, we see the story of the hundred Roman soldiers. They fell like dead men to the ground. I mean, that hundred soldiers, that's nothing. Satan's entire military was there trying to keep that grave shut. And when two angels came down from God, Ellen White says, came down from God to, to there, what did they do? They're gone, just like that. Nothing they could do. The angel rolled back the stone, one of the angels rolled back the stone, and Jesus was called to come forth in his own power. Look again at Isaiah 53, 4 to 6. But the, he endured the suffering which should have been ours, the pain which, that we should have borne, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. But because of our sins he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did, we are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. So, what are we saying there? We're saying Jesus died as a result of sin, to show us what sin does to people. If you refuse to be departed from your sins, it will happen to you. So why did people think that Jesus was being tortured by God? God had provided all the answers the that the entire universe needed. Those answers are what saves us from being deceived by the devil. God's salvation is now available to all who believe, Acts 16.31. But why was, why was that really all necessary? And I want you to think about this. What happened those last three hours before Jesus died? Everything was totally, completely black, right? Yeah. We couldn't see a single thing. You couldn't see your hand right in front of your face. But who was watching? The entire universe saw what was happening. They saw what Satan was doing, and they saw what God was doing, and they saw what Christ was doing. They could see the whole thing. We are the only ones who were completely ignorant. So, Jim? The answer to the question, why, is Isaiah's testing truth. Because of God's love, his Messiah would choose to suffer. But why? Isaiah, excuse me, Isaiah drives the golden spike into complete and unthinkable truth. He would choose to suffer in order to reach the unreachable, and the unreachable are us. Yeah, Bible wow. study guide. 
Uh, well, of course, you've already suggested that there's a lot more to do with it, dealing with the devil and his charges and so forth. Satan's deceptions must be responded to in order for us to learn the truth about God and about Satan. Yeah. The great controversy is not just for us to learn about God, that's the most important part, but we also need to learn the truth about who else? Satan. To answer Satan's claims and accusations required each step in the suffering of Christ. God would not have done if it was not necessary. This whole sequence was an essential part of the great controversy saga. Just as Job's friends were sure that Job must have committed some terrible sin and that that was why those terrible things happened to him, the religious leaders in Jesus' day believed that he was a terrible sinner because of his claims about his relationship with his Father in heaven. Carrie? What a price has been paid for us. Behold the cross and the victim uplifted upon it. Look at those hands pierced with the cruel nails. Look at his feet fastened with spikes to the tree. Christ bore our sins in his own body. That suffering, that agony is the price of your redemption. And that's from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, 1901. Yeah. Let it be understood clearly that God did not cause all these evil things to happen. He simply allowed Satan to do his worst so the onlooking universe, as well as those of us who are paying attention, may come to understand what a universe controlled by the devil would be like. Yeah. That's an incredible conclusion, isn't it? The weight, the guilt, the punishment for the sins of the whole world, every sin by every sinner, fell upon Christ at the cross as the only means to save us. What does it tell us about how bad sin is that such a price had to be paid in order to redeem us from it? What does it tell us about God's love that he would do this for us even at such a great cost? Jesus died to demonstrate the truth about sin and its, cons its results. Romans 6.23, it is not really possible to transfer my sins which are being committed in 2021 to Jesus who died almost 2,000 years ago. And that would be like an indulgence, wouldn't it? If someone already paid the price, so now I can sin, right? Sins cannot be moved around like a pile of trash. Jim? When we individually rest upon Christ with full assurance of faith, trusting alone in the efficacy of his blood to cleanse us from all sin, we shall have peace in believing that God, what God has promised he will Excuse me, he is able to perform. Christ represented, excuse me, as Christ represented the Father, so we are to represent Christ to the world. We cannot transfer our obligation to others. Reveal and Herald, uh, 19, excuse me, 1889. Okay. You want to read the next passage that goes with it? By this ceremony, the sin was through the blood transferred in figure to the sanctuary. In some cases, the blood was not taken into the holy place, but the flesh was then to be eaten by the priest, as Moses directed the sons of Aaron, saying, God hath given you, excuse me, given it you to bear the iniquities of the congregation, Levit Leviticus 10.17. Both ceremonies alike symbolize the transfer of the sin from the penitent to the sanctuary. Ellen so, White, go ahead. Go ahead. Ellen White, The Great Controversy, uh, yeah. page 418. Okay, notice here that we cannot transfer our obligation to others. And that all this stuff, for the, talking about the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, that was all done in figure. And it was symbolized. So what are we supposed to conclude? So why would God allow His Son to go through that awful experience of being separated from the Father and dying on the cross? God hopes that we will realize the awfulness of sin and choose to follow him instead of following sin and the devil. Carrie? The law of God's government was to be magnified by the death of God's only begotten Son. Christ bore the guilt of the sins of the world. Our sufficiency is found only in the incarnation and death of the Son of God. He could suffer because 
and it's in brackets, he was sustained by divinity. He could endure because he was without one taint of disloyalty or sin. Christ triumph in man's behalf in thus bearing the justice of punishment. He secured eternal life to men while he exalted the law and made it honorable. Again, from Ellen G. White's Selected Messages, book 302. Okay. <clears throat> Think of all the ways that Isaiah 53, 79 say that Jesus would be treated. Now, if you have a chance, it's a great exercise to go back and look at that and think of the things it says about how Jesus was treated. Now compare what we know about the story of his sufferings and his death as recorded in Matthew 26 and 27, Mark 14, 53 to 15, 46, Luke 22, 54 to 23, 53, and John 18, 12 through 19, 42. Those details of his suffering there. So how did the death of Christ magnify the law of God? What does that mean? Quoting, now the guilt of Satan stood, be, stood forth without excuse. He had revealed his true character as a liar and a murderer. Not only a murderer of any ordinary person, a murderer of the Son of God. It was seen that the very same spirit with which he ruled the children of men who were under his power, he would have manifested had he been permitted to control the inhabitants of heaven. He had claimed that the transgression of God's law would bring liberty and exaltation, but it was seen to result in bondage and degradation. Satan's lying charges against the divine character and, the gov and government appeared in their true light. He had accused God of seeking merely the exaltation of himself and requiring submission and obedience from his creatures and had declared that while the Creator exacted self-denial from all others, he himself practiced no self-denial uh, and made no sacrifice. I mean, this is Satan's crazy, lunatic accusation against God. Now it was seen that for the salvation of a fallen and sinful race, the ruler of the universe had made the greatest sacrifice which love could make. For God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. It was seen also that while Satan had opened the door for the entrance of sin by his desire for honor and su supremacy, Christ had, in order to destroy sin, humbled himself, became obedient unto death. God had manifested his abhorrence of the principles of rebellion. All heaven saw his justice revealed both in the condemnation of Satan and in the redemption of man. Lucifer had declared that if the law of God was changeless and its penalty could not be remitted, every transgressor must be forever debarred from God's favor, from the Creator's favor. He had claimed that the sinful race were placed beyond redemption and were therefore his rightful prey. But the death of Christ was an argument in man's behalf that could not be overthrown. The penalty of the law left fell upon him who was equal with God, and man was free to accept the righteousness of Christ and by a faith, by, I'm sorry, by a life of penitence and humiliation to triumph. As the Son of God had triumphed over the power of Satan. Thus God is just and yet the justifier of all who believe in him. But it was not merely to accomplish the redemption of man that Christ came to the earth to suffer and to die. He came to magnify the law and to make it honorable. Not alone that, in other words, Satan had claimed that nobody could living on this earth would be able to keep God's law. And Jesus said, oh yeah, just watch me. Yeah. Just watch me. Not alone that the inhabitants of this world might regard the laws that should be regarded, but it was demonstrated to all the worlds of the universe that God's law is unchangeable. Could its claims have been set aside, then the Son of God need not have yielded up his life to atone for its transgression. The death of Christ proves it immutable, and the sacrifice to which infinite love impelled the Father and the Son, uh, this, that sinners might be redeemed, demonstrates to all the universe what nothing less than this plan of atonement could have sufficed to do that justice and mercy are the foundation of the law and government of God. And the final, and, and 
so uh, let's stop, uh, stop and ask a question about that. So when Jesus went back to heaven, what did they have to say to him, do you think? Think about what was accomplished by his life and death. What were the angels the wanting? Angels understood by that time. Finally yeah. understood that he'd been everything he'd been trying to teach him. Yeah. But uh, now it would have been demonstrated. Right. Yeah. It, it, well, it, what would we say in Romans three twenty five and twenty six mm -hmm. was to teach, and of course then uh, in uh, John seventeen three and four, eternal mm -hmm. life is to know the Father and Jesus Christ who He sent, and then John verse excuse me, seventeen four. I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. That's, yep. what, you, that's what you got right, right there. Right there. So Jesus said, do you agree? He said to the beings in the universe, do you see that our way of running the government, of operating the universe, is the only way that can work? The selfish way, Satan's way, just leads to, to strife and destruction, people killing each other, etc. In the final execution of the judgment, it will be seen that no cause for sin exists. There was no excuse for it whatsoever. When the judge of all the earth shall demand of Satan, why hast thou rebelled against me and robbed me of the subjects of my kingdom? I imagine at the end of the judgment scene, God is probably going to turn to Satan and make that statement. The originator of evil can render no excuse. Every mouth will be stopped, and all the hosts of rebellion will be, what? Speechless. Speechless. This song in Isaiah 52 and 53 of the Suffering Servant has led to many vigorous discussions um, among scholars. Jewish scholars generally believe that the Suffering Servant is actually a metaphor for the nation of Israel. But as we Christians believe that, the book of Isaiah itself provides some insights to help us make a clear positive identification of the ser uh, servant as the Messiah. The song first identifies the Messiah as the king, Isaiah 52, 7 and 8. Second, it identifies the Messiah as rescuer and redeemer, Isaiah 52, 9 to 15. And finally, it identifies the Messiah as the suffering one, Isaiah 53. A third possibility is that Jesus suffered and died to answer questions in the great controversy over God's character and government, including one, what Satan really is like. Two, what a world ruled by Satan would be like. And three, what God is really like. There are two versions, verses in our study for today which seem to be in contradiction. Isaiah 53, 10 says, It was my will that he should suffer. But if we drop down, we thought all the while we thought that it was God. And so I'll leave that idea with you. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these marvelous revelations all the way back in the days of Isaiah. Someday we'll be able to ask the people of Isaiah's day, what did you think when you, when you heard all these strange words from Isaiah? Did you have any idea what he was talking about? And yet here we are, this far after your life and your death here on this earth. And yet, do we fully understand? Do we really, really understand? what you've tried to teach us. Pray that we may understand it more clearly this day and this week so that we may come to draw, we may draw nearer to you and be ready for that day when you come again is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.